One of the questions people ask me when they see the passion I have for Christ. Now, my love for Jesus is not a secret. It's not private. I love him. I stand for him all over, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So they asked me a question. How did you end up in politics? When I first went into politics, some people say politics is going to swallow you. You won't talk about Jesus anymore. Evidence after 30 years is that I still say Jesus is the only way. He is the only way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But the question is asked, how? Now, because I used to be very strongly opposed to Christian involvement in politics. No human being, I believe, could have convinced me to get involved in politics. God himself used his word to change my thinking. One day when there is time, we'll talk about the scriptures that God used to change my thinking. But there were five scriptures that I will not mention today that God used to change my thinking. How did I finally get involved? After seeing these five scriptures, I'll talk about one day. I concluded that the Lord wants me to be involved in politics. I asked the Lord questions. I find God being so accommodating and understanding that when his children ask him questions, he doesn't offend him. He doesn't offend him. So I asked God three questions. The first question was, Lord, do you want me to backslide? You want me in politics? So you want me to backslide? Let me put that in context. Why did I say that? One of the reasons why I hated Christian involvement in politics was because of a young man who in 1974 came to the University of the North with a group of other young people from Soweto. They came to the university in 1974. When those, that group of students arrived, they were talking so much about Jesus. And this young man was telling us about how God was using him with signs and wonders following. Until then, I did not know any student, any person my age or age group who God was using in signs and wonders. So when he would speak in our meetings, we would all be quiet because we thought that this man knows God more than us. And I remember I even prayed, Lord, help me to know you like this man. Help me to know you like this man because I thought you have sons and wonders so you know God, God better than me. Obviously, we know differently today. So every night between six and seven, we would meet for prayers as Christians before we go for studies. He started well with us. He would be in the front row. He's teaching us. He's telling us about these miracles. As time went on, he got involved in student politics. With time, he started missing meetings, Christian meetings. And he went to the middle row. When we'd ask him, but what's happening? No, I'm busy, my brother. I'm, I'm busy, I'm coming, I'm coming. Not long, he was in the last row. And you know, a Christian that moves to the front, to the last row, is looking for the exit. And that's what happened. He left. He backslid hopelessly. Got involved in things, terrible things that I don't want to mention. So I looked at that and I said, politics did that to my mentor. That is of the devil. That is of the devil. That's what I preached. That's why when the Lord spoke to me about politics, his, my first question to him was, Lord, do you want me to backslide? Because I thought of this man that was my mentor. Do you want me to backslide? And this is what the Lord said. The Lord said, you do not backslide when you obey me. You backslide when you disobey me. Oh, then my second question was, Lord, if politics is good for your people, why are so many Christians backsliding when they get into politics? He says, because they are unequally yoked. 
I'm not calling you to be an equally yoke, but I'm calling you to start a platform based on the principles of my word. That was the second question. They are unequally yoked. That's why many very loud Christians, when they go and join these other political parties, suddenly don't hear much from them, particularly when they're in politics. They won't talk about Jesus. They are scared. Because some of them, when they have, if they want to stand for their conviction, they are shown, that's the door. You know our policies. If you're not happy, that's the door. Go out. Go back to your church. So, to, to, to protect their positions, what do they do? They keep quiet. So, my third question. Lord, if politics is good for us, give me one role model. Show me a man in politics who doesn't compromise your weight. A man in politics who loves you and who will not compromise anything. On this one, the Lord kept quiet for a time. To an, ext to an extent that I thought, oh, I got him. I got him. God doesn't have an answer for this one. After a few minutes, the Lord said to me, I want you to be the role model. I said, me? I know nothing about politics. He said, I want you to be the role model. That is why by the grace of God, the past 29 and a half years, almost 30 years, I've been in politics. Do you know I've never missed a Sunday morning service, not one, to do politics. Not one. Since 1994. You know, the late President Mandela loved working in groups, liked working together even with leaders of the opposition. Whenever there was an important project that they were going to launch, he would invite all political leaders to join us. He said, come and join us to go and open this so that it can also be yours. And when I would get the invitation from the late Mr. Mandela, I would say, Mr. President, with all due respect, you know how much I love and appreciate you. I ask to be excused because I cannot come and join you because 10 o'clock, Mr. President, I am in the pulpit. And Mr. Mandela would say to me, I know you. No problem, Reverend can go to the church. I'm saying this, ladies and gentlemen. I know politicians today who miss Sunday services to do politics. The ACDP does not expect anybody and the ACDP does not allow any Christian to be involved with political issues during church time. Church time, we all go to church. After nourishing our spirits, then we can do politics in the afternoon. All right, so I'm now in politics. The highlight, one of, actually the highlight of my life in politics was during the constitution making process, I, in one of these videos, I shared about marching to parliament when the ANC wanted us to have a secular state. But now I am on the day the constitution was going to be adopted. The gallery was full of international journalists. Because that day, we were told, the world was going to see history made in South Africa. South Africa was going to adopt the most liberal constitution in the whole world. So they came by the hundreds. So we went into, we call it the house, to debate and adopt. Mr. Ramaphosa, the current president, started speaking. He said at the end of his speech, we will support this constitution. And there would be an applause. The cameras, there would be an applause. The gallery, everybody would applaud. Then Mr. Dittler would follow. I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like in the Constitution, but we will support the Constitution. There would be an applause. Uh, Prince Butelis would come. I don't like this, I don't like, but we support the Constitution and applause. Constant Felyun 
of the Freedom Front will come. On went the list. Until my time came, I knew I was not going to support the Constitution. So when my time came to speak, I went there, and then I said, Psalm 33 verse 4 says, The word of the Lord is right and true. And because this constitution undermines the word of the Lord, it cannot be right and it cannot be true. Therefore, the ACDP will vote against this constitution. It became dead quiet in the house. When I left the podium to go to my seat, which was a few meters, maybe 15 meters, from the podium, I heard the voice of the devil. What a fool you are. You make yourself a fool before the millions, if not billions of people all over the world who are seeing what's happening in South Africa, seeing this fool in South Africa via those cameras. I looked up to my right and I saw all those cameras. As I went to my seat, I looked up, the cameras were turning with me, turning with me. Everybody looking at this fool. When I came, I felt like crying. But I thought to myself, there are too many people, particularly women watching me. My father never wanted any of his boys to cry in front of women. He would beat you up if that would happen to you. I said, all these people are watching me. I'm not going to cry. My father would beat me. So I struck her to my seat. The camera, quiet. Camera standing with me. When I came to my seat, the Holy Spirit spoke. Oh, how I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I definitely would not have survived if it was not for the Holy Spirit. When I came to my seat, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, who said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. When I heard those words, I broke down, put my head on the desk and cried. And again he said, None of them gave you an applause. Heaven is applauding you for what you have done, what you have done. I wept. I said, Holy Spirit, thank you for helping me to do the will of God and to bring joy before heaven for standing for truth and righteousness. So ladies and gentlemen, when I stand, the day I stand before God, I want to hear those words again. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I want to encourage you. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 15, that Jesus died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. There is no better life than the life given over to Jesus for his will to be done through you. I pray that it will be your prayer. Lord, help me that the rest of my life I will live for you. I will do your will so that the day I stand before you, I will hear those words. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Nobody can convince me. There is a place where nobody can live for God. Nobody. You can live for God anywhere. Whether you are in Egypt, like Joseph, they throw you in the pit because you refuse to, to sleep with your master's wife. Or you are in Egypt. Uh, or you are in Babylon where you are told if you don't bow, you are going to be thrown into that fiery furnace. Wherever you are, by the grace of God, you can live for Christ. And I pray 
that you stand up for him. You don't compromise. Stand up for Jesus Christ. That wherever you are, you will say, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. His grace is sufficient. You can live for him victoriously. In Babylon, in Egypt, in Soweto, in South Africa, in every, any wicked area, you can still live for Jesus because of his grace that enables us. May the Lord bless you and may he renew your passion, a passion to live for him and to do his will for the rest of your life.